Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a group of people that have announced to the federal government they're planning on breaking the law. They have announced this by suing the federal government. In their lawsuit, they say, hey, federal government, we're planning on breaking the law. Yes, we are actively trying to do this, but we don't think it's a problem. We think it's actually legal. And so we want a court to tell us that it's totally okay. So this is the United States District Court of case of Christian Sandvig versus William Barr, the Attorney General. We're suing the Attorney General because we think that what we're about to do is or should be legal. We're planning on breaking your law, but we think it's okay. Here are a bunch of reasons why. Let's get started with this. Probably better to ask for permission when you're about to try to break the law, yes. Pro probably better to ask for permission if you're contemplating breaking the law, yeah. All right, let's get started with this. The plaintiffs, the purported lawbreakers, are academic researchers who intend to test whether employment websites discriminate based on race and gender. To do so, they plan to provide false information to target websites in violation of website terms and services. Plaintiffs bring a pre-enforcement challenge alleging the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as applied to their intended conduct violating times of services chills their First Amendment right to freedom of speech. All right, so we got a bunch of academic researchers, and they think that they're, that these websites, these job hosting boards that are out there, may be discriminating on the basis of sex or gender in violation of law, and they want to try to prove it. So what they're planning to do essentially is create a whole bunch of fictitious accounts and presumably establish them as though they're looking from particular genders or particular sexes and otherwise keep them neutral and see whether or not there is discrimination. All right. So they want to do this in an academically rigorous way. That is the plan. And so they want to create a whole bunch of fictitious accounts and figure out whether or not these job hosting boards are discriminating on the basis of sex or race. Fair enough. But there is a problem. There is a federal law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which basically says in short that if you are exceeding the scope of your authority when it comes to computer websites, you are breaking the law. And this website has been used. This law has been used before. Uh, to great effect, so we'll cover this. Christopher Wilson and Alan Mislove are professors of computer science at Northeastern University. For their research, Wilson and Mislove intend to access or visit certain online hiring websites for the purpose of conducting academic research providing re related discrimination. These plans include audit testing to examine whether the various hiring websites algorithms discriminate against users based on characteristics such as race or gender that constitute protected class. To conduct these audit tests, plaintiffs will create profiles for fictitious job seekers, post fictitious job opportunities, and compare their fictitious user ratings in a link of candidates for fictitious jobs. So yeah, we want to we want to use these websites that currently exist, and we're going to create a bunch of fictitious accounts and fictitious profiles, and basically catfish everybody. So we're going to try to catfish everyone by having a bunch of fake accounts and fake employees and fake everything and see what happens in terms of whether or not these things are selected on. Okay. Wilson and Miss Love state that they will take steps to minimize the impact of the research, both on the website servers and on those of the websites who may presumably be trying to actually hire people who don't exist. For instance, they will make it apparent to real job seekers and employers that their postings are fakes by stating in any fictitious job posting or any fictitious job seeker profile that the job or job seeker is not real. So, you know, Pat, it, the idea is to like let a human know it's not real, but not let the algorithm know it's not real, I guess. And therefore, it's a minimal burden. Okay, that's the argument. Both the researchers also intend to comply with payment requirements of certain websites. So we're going to pay you to list these fake things. So we're going to pay you for it. So we're not trying to defraud you in that way. Okay. But Wilson and Miss Love acknowledge that their research plans will violate target website terms of service by prohibit, prohibiting the provision of false information and or creating fake accounts. So yeah, you know, the terms of service of these websites, as you might expect, just in the neutral abstract, as you would guess, prohibit creating fake accounts and fake things. So yeah, we are planning on violating these user agreements. We are planning on doing all this stuff, you know, but there's this federal law that says we can't. So, you know, we, we're concerned about our criminal exposure. Now, I'd like to take note here that this in no way res revolves, resolves the issue as to their civil exposure because we're suing William Barr, 
the Attorney General of the United States. We're suing him in his official capacity as a chief law enforcement agent of the United States. And we're concerned about the application of a criminal law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, right? That is our concern right now, whether or not we're violating a criminal law. Now, that has absolutely no bearing of any kind whatsoever on whether or not we're violating a civil law, most notably contract law, right? Because these are agreements and they are contracts and they're doing it knowingly, willfully, and whatever. So does this have any bearing on whether or not these websites can sue these researchers for breach of contract, breach of term service, you know, uh, all kinds of civil wrongs? No, it has absolutely no bearing on that. The only issue we're trying to resolve right now is criminal exposure. But, you know, the bells in my head as an attorney are already going off that you have massive amounts of potential civil exposure in terms of contract remedies. But that's not what we're here to solve right now. We're here to solve the criminal case. So let's figure out if we have a criminal law problem or not. In 2016, these researchers and a nonprofit journalism group called First Look Media Works bought, brought this pre-enforcement challenge, the provision at issue, the law that applies. 18 U.S.C. 1030A2C, or the access provision, makes it a crime to intentionally access a computer without authorization or exceed authorized access and thereby obtain information from any protected computer. Plaintiffs argue this provision violates the first and Fifth Amendments, among other claims. Now before the court are the parties' cross-motion for summary judgment. Wilson and Miss Love renew the pre-enforcement challenge to the law, alleging that it unconstitutionally restricts their right to freedom of speech by criminalizing their research plans and journalistic activities that involve violating website terms. The government, for its part, argues the plaintiffs have failed to establish standing and that the First Amendment Protections do not shield plaintiffs from private websites' choices about whom to exclude for their service. So the government is arguing two things. First of all, that this issue isn't really ripe. And second of all, this isn't governmental action, right? The people that are doing the prohibition are private entities that are setting up private rules. And so we're just simply saying, essentially, this is akin to trespass. And so, like, you know, this isn't government action doesn't tread on the First Amendment. Reasonable argument. Let's read on. To have Article Three standing, which is to say standing before a federal court, a plaintiff must have suffered injury in fact that is fairly traceable to the conduct of the defendant and is likely to be redressed by a favorable decision. You've suffered an injury. It is due to what the other side did, and we can do something about it. That's standing. Fair enough. This court has previously concluded plaintiffs have plausibly alleged standing on the First Amendment claims at the motion to dismiss stage, but plaintiffs must now demonstrate standing with specific sets set out by affidavit or other ends. So you got past the motion to dismiss, but now we're on the summary judgment and we have more facts. So can you still make your burden? There are two ways in which litigants like plaintiffs may establish the requisite ongoing injury when seeking to enjoin a statute alleged to have violated the First Amendment. First, plaintiffs may show that they intend to engage in a course of conduct arguably affected with constitutional interests but proscribed by statute, and there exists a credible threat of prosecution thereunder. Second, they may refrain from exposing themselves to sanctions under the statute, making it sufficient showing of self-censorship. That is, they may establish the chilling effect on free expression. In either case, a constitutionally affected interest and a credible threat of enforcement are required. Without them, plaintiff can establish neither a realistic threat of legal, legal sanction for engaging in protected speech, nor an objectively good reason for self-censoring by not conducting the plan. So you have to show you are and, uh, under a real threat that really exists. Fair enough. Here, the plaintiffs take the first path and argue that they intend to engage in conduct arguably prescribed by statute. So they're saying that we're doing something, it looks like it might violate the law. So we're concerned about our criminal exposure. Okay. The government responds the plaintiff lack standing for three reasons. First, regardless of whether the Department of Justice would prosecute for their conduct, plaintiffs lack any concrete plans for conducting the research for their as applied claim involving a fake or misleading account. So, you know, this is just more of an idea rather than you actually have a plan to do it. So you basically arguing ripeness. Second, assuming you do have concrete plans, plaintiffs have not demonstrated a credible threat for prosecution. You haven't demonstrated you're going to be threatened. Personally, I think that's easier to find given the case law, but okay. And third, plaintiff's claims are too abstract to be evaluated. The government does not appear to dispute that if they can satisfy injury, in fact, they can also meet the causation and redressability to establish standing. As to the concrete plans element, the government first argues plaintiff have failed to establish the existence of any concrete plan for conducting further research for their as-applied claim. 
pre-enforcement criminal review, particularly in the First Amendment context, does not require plaintiffs to allege that they will in fact violate the regulation in order to demonstrate injury. Standing to challenge the law's burning expressive rights requires only a credible statement by the plaintiff of intent to violate the acts and conventional background expectation the government will enforce the law. So according to the case law, you don't have to say like on this date, I am going to do this particular thing against this particular time. You don't have to be quite that specific. You just have to have a genuine statement that, yes, I am planning on doing this, but it doesn't have to be that precise. Fair enough. The plaintiffs here have satisfied the standard. Wilson Lear clarify, clarified that when he said he did not have concrete plans, what he meant was that they don't have the software, they don't have a time frame, and there are no students assigned to it. But Wilson has already applied and received funding and approval for the Institutional Review Board for such a project. Likewise, Ms. Loaf testified that he has specific research plans and specific platforms his lab is studying in the sense that they're an area of research that continues to do work in. So we've conducted some steps along the way. We've already gotten together a funding plan. We've already gotten together approval. We don't yet have the software. <coughs> so we already have conducted some steps along the way. We've already conducted the funding. We've already done the approval. We've already gotten uh, review approval for this. We don't have the software yet. We don't have a time frame. We don't have any students, but we have definitely made substantial steps along the way. In other words, they're basically saying we have done attempt, right? Because an attempt, it's like we've made substantial steps along the way. So we're already attempting to break the law. So, you know, we're far enough along the way to bring a challenge. Fair enough. The government argues in response that the someday intentions without any description of concrete plans or indeed any specification of when that someday will be do not support a finding of actual or imminent injury. Well, you know, that is a fair point from the government, right? Imminent means like right this second, right now. So it's like, you know, someday we'll have the software and students. You know, I understand the government's argument, not quite imminent. But unlike the affirmation someday intentions to visit endangered species on another continent and an issue in a different case, these research plans are already in motion, even if the specifics are already still being developed. So there was another case was like, yeah, we're planning on doing it, but they hadn't conducted enough steps along the way. So this court is saying, yeah, you've conducted enough steps along the way. So that's a judgment threshold question. Like, when is enough enough, right? Right. So like, you know, the ultimate enough would be I'm actually doing it right now. But then, of course, I'm violating the law. So it's like there's got to be some threshold somewhere between, you know, an idea and the actual execution of the idea. So how far along that path do you have to be? It's a little amorphous, but the court says you're far enough along as compared to this prior case. Makes sense to me. The fact that plaintiffs have secured funding and clearance to engage in conduct covered by the challenge evinces a sufficient demonstration of injury in fact. Fair enough. I'm, I'm a happy camper. So now that their plans are sufficiently far along to show that they do have the intent, they have the mental state, right? We have to go to whether or not there's a credible threat of prosecution. So it's like, okay, you've done enough to show that there's a plan, but do you have a credible threat that the government will come after you for a crime? Let's see what the government has to say about this. Under their theory of standing, the plaintiffs must show they intend to engage in conduct arguably protected by the First Amendment and proscribed, which is to say forbidden, by a statute they challenge, and that there is a credible threat the statute will be enforced against them when they do so. Yeah. So it must be forbidden by the statute. There's a credible threat that we're going to be that we're going to be criminally sanctioned, right? Okay. The government argues the plan failed to establish a credible threat of prosecution under the law, contending that plan of testimony shows they do not fear prosecution and already engaged in such research, you know, so they're saying, well, you've already done this in the past and we didn't prosecute you then, so we're not going to prosecute you now. Now, I don't know that that works, you know, you know, past CFAA prosecution should not establish a criminal threat that this conduct will be, pro will be prosecuted and the government's charging policies and public statements undercut the attempt to establish credible threat. The standing to challenge laws burdening expressive rights requires only a credible statement by the plaintiff of intent to commit the violative acts and a conventional background expectation the government will enforce the law. So again, going to the standard here, right? What standard do I have to prove, right? A credible statement of intent to violate the law. I intend to violate the law. Why, why is it credible? Well, I'm a bunch of, we're a bunch of research and we've already asked for approval and already gotten funding and already gotten approval. The wheels are in motion. Yeah, so it's like, okay, yeah, that seems credible. And a conventional background expectation the government will enforce the law. So you don't have to show the intent to enforce the law in this specific exact case. You don't have to show like the FBI is making plans or raiding you or anything like that. You just have to show the conventional background is that, hey, if you do this, the government might take notice and might sanction us criminally. 
First, the plaintiff's testimony that they do not subjectively fear prosecution under the statute, and they even have engaged in the alleged chilled conduct previously, does not undermine the legal claim. The question is whether there exists a credible threat, which is objective, rather than a subjective inquiry. So I, I like that very much. The question is one of subjective versus objective standards. Subjective to you personally. Objective, the reasonable man test, right? And so the court has said, well, the reason that the test here is the conventional background criminality of it. So the issue isn't whether or not you subjectively think you're going to be criminally sanctioned or not. The issue is whether or not a reasonable person would, right? Because there's some people who have hubris enough to think that they won't be prosecuted or some people so skittish, they think the government's going to come after them for any little thing. So we're not looking to whether what you think, what you think is irrelevant. We're looking to what a conventional objective standard is. So your own statements that, hey, I've done this in the past. Hey, I've done this in the past. And, you know, I've done this in the past. Government says, well, subjectively, it looks like you don't have any fear. Court says, who cares about subjective? That isn't the issue. The issue is objective, not subjective. So government, you've answered the wrong question. Fair enough. Even assuming the absence of prior prosecutions, plaintiffs are still not precluded from bringing this pre-enforcement action. So the fact you haven't been criminally prosecuted in the past is not a bar when the constitutionality protected conduct falls within the scope of conduct and the government has not disavowed an intention of invoking criminal prosecution penalties plaintiffs are not without some reason in fearing prosecution and bring have standing to bring suit indeed at the pleading stage the court has already rejected the contention the lack of similar prosecutions undermines a credible threat threat of prosecution now so yeah like this this is also like going the other way too like, just because, like, you've done a whole bunch of stuff in the past and the government hasn't prosecuted you before doesn't mean they can't prosecute you now. And from time to time, we've seen defendants go into court and say, hey, I've been breaking the law for years. And just now the government has decided to come after me. And the, the government's like, and the courts are like, well, what do you want? It's like, you know, just because you got away with it scot-free for the last 20 years, I don't know what to tell you. They finally, they finally caught up with you, you know? So, you know, they, they, they didn't notice or they didn't care, but now they care. So it's like, yeah, the fact that, you know, you haven't been prosecuted in the past, you know, even if the government, even if you can show the government knew about it and like we're giving you a parade, basically, you know, even if you can show that, we just don't really care. You know, I don't know why the government didn't prosecute you before. Maybe they didn't notice. Maybe they did notice. Maybe they decided you weren't important enough. Maybe they were corrupt. We just really don't care. We don't care. They've noticed now. It's on the books. You get to be prosecuted. So the fact you haven't been prosecuted before is not a bar to criminal prosecution now. Because, of course, it's not, you know, just because I speed down this road every single day, officer, every single day I speed down this road. And today you decide to pull me over. Well, that's unfair. I mean, get out of here with this argument. Get out of here. That's not going to work. Right. And so the same thing here. It's like, well, we feel being, being prosecuted. And the government says, well, we've never prosecuted you before. But the, this court is thinking to themselves, I've heard defendants make that exact same argument. Well, I've never been prosecuted before. And the government says, well, who cares? And now the government's saying, well, you've never been prosecuted before. And now the court is saying, well, who cares? You know, you're the ones who like, you know, 10 minutes ago in a different case, not literally, figuratively 10 minutes ago, but figuratively 10 minutes ago in a different case, we're arguing you could prosecute this guy because it's all the statutes. And just because they haven't been prosecuted before, who cares? And now you're saying, well, we haven't prosecuted this guy before, so he has no, nothing to fear. Did you not listen to yourself from 10 minutes ago? What are you talking about? You know, of course he has something to fear. You know, just because he speeds down the road every day and has never been arrested yet, you know, tomorrow could be the day. What are you talking about? I'm with the court. You know, you can't have it both ways, government. You can't have it both ways. Third, the government points to guidance from the attorney general that expressly cautions against prosecutions based on terms of service violations, as well as statements to Congress by Department of Justice officials as evidence the plan faces no credible threat. But the absence of a specific disavowal of prosecution undermines the government's argument. So, yeah, you know, we've we've put out a statement that says prosecutors, you should be careful on this. You know, you should you should you should not probably use this one. And we have statements to Congress where it's like, yeah, we're not really in the business of this. But it's not quite the same thing as saying we will not. You know, you haven't quite gone quite as far as disavow. You've never said, oh, we're just not going to bring these cases. You said, eh, we probably shouldn't, eh, we probably wouldn't. You know, you've 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 done the uh, mealy mouth uh, words thing and sort of couched your language. And so, you know, all these statements in the past, who cares? You know, it's like, eh, you probably shouldn't, but some prosecutor out there could. This letter isn't gonna save you. You know, all the statements from the Department of Justice to Congress before, none of those are gonna save you. 
Because none of them were saying we will not. Saying, yeah, we probably wouldn't in this situation, probably wouldn't in this situation. Not enough, I agree. The government insists it's not a defendant's burden to come forward with proof of a non-existent threat of prosecution. But while the burden of demonstrating standing remains on plaintiff, this court has previously ruled in the absence of an explicit statement disavowing prosecution. There were various advisory and non-binding statements. Those would be the key words in this sentence. Advisory. Non-binding. In other words, who cares? And Department of Justice policies do not eliminate the fear of prosecution. Yes, because they were advisory and non-binding. It would be nice does not qualify as like you can be assured in this, right? Furthermore, as noted above, the government has brought similar access provision prosecutions in the past, and thus there is a criminal basis of prosecution. Yes, definitely in the past, yes. The government also argues that plaintiff's claims are not ripe for adjudication. The plaintiff have not yet identified specific websites they intend to access, the government says, and hence it's impossible to know what those terms of service will be at the time of research, which I suppose is a surf, surf, superficially fair point. Right? They haven't said which websites. They haven't said which times of service. They haven't proved that what they're going to do is violate the times of service. So what is the argument in contra? Our would-be potential miscreants, otherwise known as the plaintiffs, have responded first that because terms of service are always subject to change, it will be impossible to know what a website's exact terms of service will be in the future or whether researching will violate those terms implicit in the access provisions. Accordingly, plaintiffs will have to undertake research, taking note of terms of service actually in effect at the time, and exposing themselves to criminal liability in order to challenge the access provisions applicable to them, a drastic and risky step that plaintiff argued is not required by the First Amendment. Yeah, we don't have to do research on this because, not for at least the reasons, these terms of services are changing all the time, yes. Still, based on the record before, the court concludes that the present decision is ripe. Plaintiff lists several websites, LinkedIn, Monster, Glassdoor, and and Tella, which I've actually never heard of, that they plan to visit and describe intending to violate those times of service by creating false accounts and information providing false or misleading information. The government's own exhibits make clear the extent to which the websites, like the LinkedIn, both prohibit and attempt to eliminate false accounts, which is their prerogative because it's their websites and their stuff. And again, this has nothing to do with the civil issues. I assume very strongly that if the researchers go forward with their plans, they will be sued by these companies. And I see no immediate reason why they can't be. So, you know, these these companies will probably go and get injunctions for these researchers. And I see no obvious reasons why they won't be able to get them. But, you know, until that happens, the issue is criminal, not civil. Assuming then the plaintiffs have satisfied the injury in fact requirement, the court nevertheless concludes the First Amendment claim is moot. It's not relevant. Why? As discussed below, courts have disagreed as to the breadth of the CFAA's access provisions. There has been a lot of dispute on it. Yes. If this court determines the access provision does not actually criminalize the conduct, namely violating the website's term of service, the court need not dive and judicial economy would advance against diving into the First Amendment issue. So the various courts have disagreed as to the application of the criminal law and what it does or does not criminalize, which is fair enough because, you know, they're all trying to interpret the law. So the court has to determine first whether or not this would violate the law. It is a general maxim of courts, that of constitutional avoidance, that you try to avoid the constitutional issue if you can. So like, if there's any way to resolve an issue other than by invoking the constitution, you usually try pretty hard. And here they're saying, look, if it's not a criminal violation at all, then we don't have to decide whether or not it's a first amendment problem because it's not even a criminal law problem in the first instance. So can we avoid this by simply saying it's not a crime? Let's find out. The CFAA prohibits intentionally accessing a computer without authorization or exceeding authorized access and thereby obtaining information from any protected computer. The term protected computer refers to any computer used in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce or communication, which, you know, internet, that's all the computers pretty much, but fair enough. And no party disputes the servers or other computers associated with the websites here constitute protected computers because, again, they're connected to the internet, which is inherently an interstate or foreign communication. Yeah, no problem. Although the CFAA does not define the term authorization, courts have found the term clear and given it a straightforward meaning. The Ninth Circuit, for instance, has consistently interpreted authorization to mean permission or power granted by authority. The statutory text is less clear, however, when it comes to the entire phrase accesses a computer without authorization. So we know what authorization is, but we're not quite so sure what accesses it without authorization is, okay? The CFAA does not define the phrase, 
but the wording of the statute forbidding access without authorization suggests a baseline in which access is not generally available, and so permission is ordinarily required. This wording thus contemplates a view of the internet as divided into two different realms, public websites or portions of website where no authorization is required, and private websites or portions of websites where permission must be granted for access. So again, according to this circuit's interpretation, and again, this is this circuit's interpretation, not every circuit's interpretation. Other circuits have gone the other way. So before you go implement something in your state, take note that other courts may have gone the other way. But according to this court, at least, this whole premise assumes a baseline authorization, that you're exceeding the authorization. And so if it's generally available to the public, then you're not exceeding an authorization because you never need one in the first place. If it's private, then you might be exceeding it. So the question is whether or not this is public, generally accessible without authorization, in which case this whole thing doesn't work, or private, in which case this whole thing works. Again, your mileage may substantially vary in other parts of the country, so take note. Most courts agree with a case called High Q Labs that access without authorization is contemplating this two-round internet that we've just described. A, a user that accesses a computer without authorization when he gains admission without approval. So again, you have to like private versus public. The statutory and legislative history of the law support this public-private reading of the provision. Originally part of the Counterfeit Access Device and Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1984, the CFAA has been substantially modified over the intervening decades. Adopting the formulation of the Ninth Circuit in, in High Q Labs, this court will call the barriers between public internet and private authorization permission requirements. Under this interpretation, the question becomes what sort of permission requirement constitutes enough of a barrier to trigger the liability if it is bypassed. The government suggests this permission requirement can be minimal. Okay, so fair enough. So we have said that if you need to exceed a permission for authorization, that is the standard. But like how much permission and what kind of barrier? So the government has suggested permission here would be a very minimal requirement. And I've definitely seen that in other cases. Like, because again, terms of service would tend to suggest permissions, right? So it could be read that way. So the government has said, hey, this is, we're going to go for a maximalization approach, which is normally what they do in criminal law. We're going to interpret it to cover as much stuff as possible. So any amount of authorization that exceeds any amount of grant would be a problem. Let's read on. For example, the government says that an announcement on a homepage of a website that access to any further conduct is conditioned on agreeing to lengthy terms of service or even one of a term of service, would the government argues constitute such a requirement? So any kind of notice as to any kind of violation would be enough. The court concludes that agreeing to such contractual restrictions, although they may have consequences for civil liability, is not sufficient to trigger the criminal liability. Terms of service do not constitute a permission requirement that violated constitute criminal liability. So here the court is saying, look, breach of contract is one thing. Mere breach of contract by itself does not a criminal law make. That is not enough. And again, your mileage may vary substantially in other courts in other parts of the country. But this court is saying for us, it's not enough to simply say the access requirement that they're violating is one set out by term of service. That's a contract issue, not a criminal issue. So that's what this court says. Let's continue. A number of considerations lead the court to this conclusion. First, website terms of service provide inadequate notices for the purposes of criminal liability. These protean contract agreements are often long, dense, and subject to change. Yeah, a little bit. While some websites force a user to agree to terms before accessing so-called click wrap, others simply provide a link at the bottom of a page or place the terms, often in fine print, elsewhere on the page. Significant notice problems arise if we allow criminal liability to term on vagaries of private policies that are lengthy, opaque, subject to change, and seldom read. So there is generally an idea that the criminal law has to put you on sufficient notice to understand what is criminal. This is, among other things, what we would call vagueness doctrine. You know, if the criminal law is too vague to provide you notice of what is prohibited, it's a problem. Now, as always, we can't confuse breadth with vague. So just because a criminal law is broad, doesn't mean it's vague. The criminal law can prohibit a whole bunch of stuff as long as it's clear. But if it's unclear, that's a problem. And here they're saying, look, the, there's just no way because, you know, the criminal law might be 
clear enough on its face, but then you have to go to these, these terms of service, which are long, complicated, subject to change at any time with, with, or, with or without notice. It's like, it's not enough to put an average person on notice as to what is prohibited. You're not giving them clear enough notice. And I am very sympathetic to sympathetic to that argument. You know, the criminal law needs to be sufficiently clear. And if you know, you're resorting to a clause in a term of service that you clicked on that no one ever bothered to read in the first place as triggering criminal law, it's like, nope, nope, too much, too much. It's not clear enough. So it's vague. It's, it's void for vagueness would be another way of putting it. I have no problems with that. That's fine. Second, although not a paradigmatic example of non-delegation, enabling private website owners to define a scope of criminal liability does raise clones, concerns for a court. So yeah, this isn't exactly non-delegation, which prohibits, you know, Congress from delegating to other people the ability to define the law. It's not quite that, but it is like problematic in that you're giving these private entities so much control. Fair enough. Previously, this court has determined that a narrow interpretation of the law, that limited access restrictions saved the statute from becoming limitless, standardless delegation of power to individual websites to define crimes. Yeah, that is a real problem in this domain. You know, if we look to terms of service to define the crime, it's like it's too much because, again, it's buried deep in language that's subject to change at any time that people don't have notice of. It's like, it, you know, the, we can't make a criminal law out of this. You know, we can't we can't turn everyone to criminals. That's just not fair. People have to have some notice of what the law is. You know, it has to has it has to be well, it has to be reasonably understood so people can understand. Again, like no law is going to be perfect. But this law is so subject to the whims of the person who can change this at any time in very dense, obscure, hard to find language. It's like, nope, nope, too far, too far. I tend to agree. Upon further reflection and now presented with additional evidence as to the nature of the target website terms of service, the court finds it's necessary to answer another question. Whether terms of service conditions rather than authentication gates constitute adequate permission requirements. So do the terms of service as opposed to like password issues, it constitute permission requirements. So, you know, not, not hacking a password, but the terms of service. Okay. Again, the court concludes the narrow interpretation is the wiser path. The government analogizes website owners to real property owners who historically have been allowed to exclude whomever they want from their private non-commercial land. But the analogy between real property and the internet is not perfect. The internet is inherently open to the public and users constantly move from one website to another and navigate between various sections of given websites. So the government has argued, and there's some merit to this on first reflection, so let's give it its full weight. Let's really consider it, right? The government has said, look, if this were real property, which is to say land, which is to say like a person's home or a business or whatever, right? We, no one would have any problem with a private entity creating any kind of rules they want for access to its building, right? They can be complicated, obscure, difficult to follow. You know, you can have any rules you like. You know, you're a private entity. You can let people in, not let people in. You can change them on any basis you want. You can go fully Willy Wonka on this thing. You know, it can, they can be like, you know, you can de determine on days of the week. It can determine on your mood. It can determine on anything you like, right? So normally in real property law and business law, you know, again, there are some exceptions to this. Businesses can't discriminate on the basis of race. They can't discriminate on the basis of sex. But generally, businesses have the right to refuse service to anyone at any time, as long as it's not a protected reason. And they don't necessarily have to give you advance notice of it. And they can say, I'm excluding you, which is why the balancer can throw your ass out of the building, right? As long as you're not doing it for a protected reason, they can do it on a whim. They don't have to have a reason. They can do it just because they feel like it, as long as it's not a protected reason. You know, and they can do it anytime they want. No problem, right? So normally this is this is fine, right? But there's a bit of a difference factually in how the internet works versus how real property works. You know, in real property world, you know, every you know, we walk through doors, we understand that they're private, you know, we understand what private doors are, what public doors are, you know, no one would walk through a person's home because we all understand the restrictions. Businesses, we all understand how they work, their notices of what they do and do not allow are fairly clear. You know, if it's a club that says, you know, no gang colors or no whatever, you know, they post notice clearly outside the door. You know, we all understand these rules. They're reasonably apparent. 
And even then, like, if you violate the rules, usually they'll throw you out of the building. You know, we don't immediately go straight to trespass. It's like, hey, you can't, you know, wear that because it's a violation of our decorum. You know, we require people to wear a, a coat and tie. You're not wearing a coat and tie. You're in violation of our rules. So normally the sanction is we're going to kick you out, not we're immediately going to have you arrested for trespass. So even then it's like, you can't come in, get out. It's only if you say, no, I'm coming in, then we'll arrest you for trespass, right? So kind of the same thing here. So the analogy isn't perfect and the situation is different because in the internet world, it's like, everyone come in, everyone come in. We're open to the public. Everyone can come in. You know, everyone's welcome. Everything, you know, it's, so it's a different factual environment. So like the, the, the way people behave has a manifest reality on how this thing is. So like in one sense, they're private property owners, but they're also like private property owners who as part of a collective have basically said everyone is welcome all the time and then have tried on the back end to put in like some obscure rules. It's like you can't kind of have it both ways. You know, that's just not fair to people and how they're behaving. So again, the analogy does break down because on one level they are like real property owners, private property owners, but in another sense, they're not. So, you know, in the same sense that like something can be like something, it also breaks down. And now all analogies break down eventually. And this is an example of where that's happening. Under these circumstances, the CFAA's prohibition on accessing a computer without authorization, even though form of in the form of general prohibition that can escape non-delegation worries, becomes unworkable and standardless. So even though like it is not a non-delegation problem, it is unworkable. It's standardless because everyone is doing everything all the time and people are bouncing all over the place. You know, it's not even real, like real property in the sense of like, cause you actually have to walk from place to place. I, you know, in the internet world, I can go anywhere at any time. I can go everywhere, I can go multiple places. So real world analogies break down, right? Criminalizing term of service violations risks turning every website into its own criminal jurisdiction and each webmaster into its own legislature. Such an arrangement where each serves a service is law unto itself would raise serious problems. This concern thus supports a narrow interpretation of CFA. So it's like, look, if we look at this broadly, parade of horribles, everything is going to go to completely to shit. And so like, we're not going to do that. We're just not going to do that. We're going to interpret the law narrowly to give people notice of what is and is not prohibited. So law is written generally, it's written widely, which incidentally is why you thought you might be prosecuted because it's written broadly and written widely, right? So we understand that. We understand the problem, but we're going to fix the problem. We're going to fix the problem by interpreting the statute narrowly. We're going to say, no, 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 no. Terms of service are not enough. This is not what the law had in mind. And even if it did, it's unworkable. It can't be done. It's like, we are not going to allow every place on the internet when people can bounce all around the place to have any kind of policy they want, that changes any time they want. And when you enter, that is the trespass, right? Because again, even in the real world equivalent, even in the real world equivalent, like if you walked into like a nice country club or walked into like a, a, a nice restaurant that required coat and tie and you didn't have on the right kind of attire, right? Even if there were a notice outside the door that said this and you walked in, I don't think you can automatically be arrested for trespass. I don't think that's going to fly in the real world. Like, even if there's a sign outside the door, you know, they can say, sir, you're not up to our dress code. First of all, they don't have to give you a written notice of it. But I'm arguing even if there was written notice, like even there's written notice, even outside the door. And it's like you walk in the door and they say, sir, we don't allow that tire. You have to leave. Right. I don't think you walk in the door and the police can immediately tackle you and arrest you. I don't think that's going to fly in the real world. No, no. I think that's too far. I think that's too far. I think I have to ask you to leave first. And then if you refuse to leave, then they can arrest you. But like, you know, a, you know, you must wear a coat and tie outside the door. You walk through the door, the police tackle you for an arrest because you're guilty of trespass. I don't see that flying in the real world equivalent either. Too much, too much, no. You know, you still have to orally ask them to leave. And if they don't, then you can arrest them. But you know, you can't tackle them as they come in the door. I think that's going too far. And so like the equivalent here on the in the internet world, again, I think for the same reason, it's like, you know, you violate our terms of service. You have gone too far. We're going to immediately arrest you. Nope. Nope. Too far. Too far. Yeah, I agree. Third, both the rule of lenity and avoidance canon weigh in favor of the narrow interpretation as well. The rule of lenity basically says that all us being equal, we are lenient in interpreting the criminal law because we don't want to over criminalize things. So all us being equal, if the law is ambiguous. We're going to interpret it to not cover what you're doing. That's the rule of lenity. You know, that's the general rule. But as you might imagine, 
it's more complicated than that in an application because it's it's fairly rarely invoked. Not for the least of reasons that the criminal law is usually pretty clear. But if it's vague, we'll give you a break. And avoidance canon also says, yeah, we're going to avoid criminalizing things when not, right? When interpreting a criminal statute, we do not play the part of a mind reader. If a reasonable doubt persists as to a statute scope, even after resort to language and structure or legislative history, the courts must adapt the narrow interpretation. So if we're in doubt, we narrow the construction. We narrow it down. Likewise, constitutional avoidance weighs in favor of interpreting access without authority narrowly. If the court were to conclude that they do violate, then we'd have to describe whether prosecuting violates the First Amendment. So if we, you know, constitutional avoidance, constitutional avoidance, it says we, uh, we avoid the constitutional issues whenever we can. It's a well-accepted doctrine of, of courts. We avoid constitutional issues whenever possible. So we're going to do, we're going to try to avoid the issue. So if we interpret it to cover this conduct, we'd have to answer the constitutional question. But we don't want to do that, so we're not going to interpret it in the first place. It's pretty well understood, and I agree with the application here. As the court has previously observed, it need not decide whether plaintiff's constitutional argument would win the day, but rather whether one presents a significant risk, it'll be infringed. The First Amendment challenges raise risk, and thus weigh in favor of a narrow interpretation. Yeah, we've noticed that you've presented a valid First Amendment argument, and we'd actually have to consider it if we said that this violated the First Amendment, so we're just going to avoid the issue altogether. You win because it's not criminal. We're not going to answer the First Amendment question. Have a nice day. No problem. Courts do this all the time. Although bypassing code-based restrictions like a social security number or credit card requirement are, paradigm are paradigmatic examples of an authentication gate, the key point is not that some code was circumvented, but rather the computer owned conditions access the user and access was outside authentication. So yeah, if you were breaching like a password, that'd be different, but you're not doing that. You're violating terms of service. Not enough for us. Here, neither Wilson nor Mislov have attempted to bypass, bypass an authentication gate as we have defined it, as we're in a court. We're interpreting the law. This is now what it means. And they're not attempting to do that. Great. For websites requiring logon credentials, username, and password, Wilson and Mislov intend to provide the information they generate when they create the tester accounts. And for websites that require payments, they intend to comply with the payments. None of these research plans then bypasses the authentication, and none of them will be required to execute a violation of the law. So yes, we're going to sign up for accounts. Yes, we'll pay you if we have to. You know, they're fraudulent accounts for a violation of your contract, but you know, that's all we're violating of. And again, when this comes to the civil law case, I'm pretty sure these guys are going to come get completely owned. So when Monster or whomever finds out that they're doing this and sues them, I'm pretty sure they'll be able to get their injunction. But you know, it's not criminal in the first instance. So yeah, you know, it's not going to be criminal. It's going to be a civil violation. I'm pretty sure a court's going to issue the injunction, but, you know, you don't have to fear the attorney general. So that's good news, I guess. Turning to the second part of the access provision, the CFAA prohibits exceeding authorized access. The CFAA defines the term exceeds access to mean access to a computer with authorization and to use such to obtain or alter information that the accessor is not entitled to. This language suggests an individual cannot exceed authorized access without first legitimately passing through the permission. After all, the violator must use the authorized access in order to obtain the information to which the person is not entitled. This interpretation aligns with the Ninth Circuit's distinction, access without authorization applying to outsized hackers, and exceeding authorized access implies to inside hackers. So access without authorization, outside hackers. Exceeding authorized access, inside hacker. Outside, inside. Fair enough. If bypassing our permission requirement is not the action that triggers criminal liability, however, the question remains what type of conduct does constitute a criminal act? Okay, so what is criminal? Fair enough. In other words, what distinguishes inf information the authorized accessor is entitled to obtain or alter from information which they're not entitled? Does the plaintiff anticipated provision of false information to the target website in violation cross that line and exceed the authorized access? The resolution of this question in part turns on the meaning of entitled in the statutory definition of exceeds authorized access. The government argues that entitled means to furnish with a right and supports a broad interpretation of the phrase exceeds access, in which all relevant facts, including private policies, may be considered in determining access. So we consider, consider those terms of service, and if you exceed them in any way, you're in violation. Fair enough. By this approach, the meaning of exceeds authorized access is content dependent. Because the computer owner furnishes an individual with right to access its systems and obtain information from them, explicit policies restricting that right of access determines when an individual exceeds the authorized access. 
According to the government, such explicit policies include employers' computer use policies and terms of service for the public websites. The plaintiffs seem to have agreed with this interpretation for much of the litigation and assume that they do fall outside it. Yeah, that's the entire point of the plaintiff is that we're really worried about. So the government says that like any violation would do. The plaintiffs say, yeah, you're right. That's why we're worried. Yeah. Rather than interpret the statute narrowly, they argue their actions are protected by the First Amendment. So he's like, yeah, we're going to interpret the same way you do, but we think it's a First Amendment protections argument. argument. The plaintiffs now sa suggest they would be satisfied with declaratory and injunctive relief barring prosecution for violation terms of service. In other words, a narrow interpretation. So initially they said, yeah, we think the broad interpretation is right. We think we're okay under the First Amendment. But now they say, no, we're okay with a narrow interpretation and not to blame them. Probably because the court suggested an oral argument if I were a betting man, right? So I'd, I'd say, well, would you be happy if we simply said the narrow interpretation is right? And it's like, yes. And so it's like, okay, then we can do the narrow interpretation. We don't have to do the broader issue. Fair enough. Courts have come to a range of views on the best interpretation of exceeds authorized access, and the circuits are currently divided whether in an employment context, employees' violation of company policy violates the CFAA. So this would be the internal hacker thing. So if an internal employee is violating it, is it a problem? No, narrow, narrow interpretation doesn't mean case by case. That would be the broader one, case by case. So narrow one is we're just going to narrow the statute down so it doesn't apply this in the first instance. The 1st, 5th, 7th, and 11th circuits have concluded that a person with access to a computer for business purposes exceeds authorized access when they obtain information for a non-business reason. So if you're an internal employee and you're exceeding it, then they, those circuits say this is a problem. However, the 2nd and 4th circuits have come to an opposite conclusion. So the circuits are in disagreement, which again goes to my caution, your mileage may vary. Far fewer courts have weighed in on the facts before this court, namely whether violating the term of service constitutes a criminal violation. But the majority of courts have determined there's no liability. So this, the courts have disagreed as to whether or not an employee who violates terms of service of his employment is in violation of the law. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about an employer-employee context. We're talking about a user context. And so the courts that have weighed on this have so far seemed to side with us. But again, your courts may, your violation may vary. The court agrees with a clear weight of relevant authority and adopts a narrow approach. Without weighing in on the circuit split, split over the issue of employee policies, the court concludes that violating public terms of service as they propose to do for the research does not constitute. So, you know, we're not going to weigh in on the issue as to employees because it's not the issue at hand. But we are going to say that generally people violating terms of service is not a violation of the CFAA. So, no, it's not a violation of the law. Taken together, these considerations make clear that even if reading exceeds authorized access to exclude terms of service is not the only reasonable interpretation, which, you know, it's not, but adopting the narrow approach is the wisest path forward. So although it's not the, the only approach, we're going to constrain the law, which we can do because we're a court. We're going to say, no, we're going to interpret this narrowly because we can, and it saves, our, it saves the problem we're trying to solve. Okay. In agreement with the clear weight of relevant cases, the court adopts this narrow interpretation and concludes it doesn't violate. So we could go broad and say it does violate it, or it could go narrow and say it doesn't. And we're going to go narrow and say it doesn't. Fair enough. For the foregoing reasons, the court concludes plan for research plans do not violate the access provisions. Because the actions are not criminal, because we've said so, because we're a court and we're defining it, so we're telling you they're not criminal because we can do that because we just interpreted the law, yay, the court not need, need not wade into the question of whether it's a First Amendment issue. Because it's not criminal, because we said so. Instead, the court concludes the court the, the, the cross motions are moot and the case will be dismissed. A separate order will issue on this later. Fair enough. So that is the end of our coverage of the case of Christian Sandvig versus William Barr. In this case, a group of research attorneys sued the federal government saying, hey, federal government, we're planning on violating the law. What you going to do about it? And so then they went and argued about it for a while. And the court has said, well, actually, as it turns out, you're not violating the law after all. This is not a First Amendment issue because it wasn't criminal at all. So, you know, go forth with your plan. Uh, it's not criminal law violation. Um, but as I've pointed out many, many, many times, this is a criminal law decision. It's not criminal. It has nothing to do with the civil law issues. Nothing to do with the breach of contract claims that I am sure are inevitably coming. So these researchers, I imagine, will be sued or may have even been sued by some of these companies because they like, hey, we, we're planning on doing this. And so in the same way, they can get prospective relief. These other companies can get prospective relief. So if Monster et al. have not already sued them, I imagine they will and say, hey, we, we hear that you're planning on violating our terms of service. You can't do that. 
and they'll say it's a breach of contract. And I'm pretty sure they'll be right, and the courts will issue an injunction. So, you know, you can go forward through your plan. Um, you don't have to fear criminal law violation, but, you know, the civil lawsuits that are, that are about to come, if they already haven't come, well, it's a whole other scope of issues. Good luck with that. And that's the end of our current coverage. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.